Welcome. Uh, once again, you nailed the heart of the issue when so many are only briefly grasping the importance of what is done on an extremely important national security issue. This past week, your article, Preventing Espionage and Terrorism, the real purpose behind Trump's proposals for foreign student and exchange visa, visitor visas probably had many asking questions about those who would think differently. Can you tell us about the reasons why it's so important to revise the student visa and the visa visitor programs? Sure, well, let me just start by saying that about a week and a half ago, the Trump administration posted its proposed new regulation for the student visa, that's called the F student visa, and also the cultural exchange visa. There's, there's two different visas here that allow foreigners to come to this country and study in universities or at research institutions. And when this thing got posted, there was an almost knee jerk response and reaction from many in the media who called it racist, uh, burdensome, terrible in different ways and interpreted this thing as somehow anti-immigrant, uh, a way to kind of shut down student visa issuance. Uh, but that's not what is actually in the proposal. If you actually read the proposal, what you find is a uh, sober explanation of why this is being proposed. Uh, and it's on two grounds. One is espionage. We have had a long spate of cases in which Chinese students and researchers are coming in on these visas and stealing secrets and shipping it right back to the Chinese military, the PLA. Uh, by my count, there's probably 12 indictments, uh, maybe 11 indictments and dozens of active investigations, according to DOJ, into People's Liberation Army spies inside the United States who are taking advantage of these visas to come in here and get with, you know, extremely elite, that's pro probably uh, a double entendre, but um, elite academic institutions where high level technology research is happening and development. And they're shipping that back to the Chinese military. Uh, and they're they're uh, being indicted for mostly visa fraud, lying about being with the army, with the Chinese army. And then the other issue is Islamic terrorism, that we have had too many cases of people coming from Muslim majority countries on student visas, cultural exchange visas, and then committing terrorism crimes. So. Um, what the Trump administration proposes to do here is to just require time limits on these visas, two years or four year time limits. Uh, that doesn't mean you go home. That just means that, that if you're one of the two year visa holders, you have to go in to see an immigration officer, be interviewed, prove that you were here doing uh, valid work with a valid program, uh, and also that your extension is based on more work that is valid uh, and, and that you have to give a date and you have to submit fingerprints and biometrics and things like that. Just kind of normal things that, that you would expect to uh, submit to if you were to get one of those fast pass TSA airline uh, passes, you know, to get, to get through the, the uh, airport security screening. So that's generally what, what the, the, the purpose of this thing is to just sew up that system of visa issuances. Uh, before I stop there, I just wanna point out that, that currently those visas are open-ended. Uh, once you have one of these visas, all you have to do is just uh, stay in the country until your institution says you should go home or that it's over. But those institutions very often are incentivized by to foreign tuition uh, payments and also the cheap labor, frankly, that these uh, researchers are coming in here and, 
working their butts off for 80 hours a week or 100 hours a week for almost nothing. And they're incentivized to keep these people on for as long as possible. These programs are riddled with fraud, with immigration fraud uh, and cheating on the system. What this does is it just puts some reasonable measure of checks and balances into those, the F and J visas. It's interesting. You used the term laissez-faire, and um, as a social studies teacher, I teach that every year, that term. And I think I taught it as the hands-off policy. You don't touch, uh, especially when we're talking about economics. Um, but if I look at it this way, I'm thinking, like, we've really done nothing. You said open-ended. I think you're really being generous. But the what about... Um, is there any punishment currently for organizations that don't report uh, when they discharge somebody or a student stops going? I mean, only to the extent that there have been cases where, I'll put this in quotation marks, a university or a school has been caught in the act of producing diplomas like in a mill. Uh, they're not real schools at all. And those schools obviously benefit from the F and J visas because they're, they're selling access to the United States. Uh, those institutions or, you know, entities, I, I don't even think they're real institutions most of the time, get caught fairly often selling uh, sponsorships to foreign students to, who, who have no interest in studying whatsoever. They just want to get into the United States and disappear. Uh, and that happens. And I do believe that the rules get bent at major, uh, you know, mainstream academic uh, institutions uh, because they're incentivized to do so. This new regulation takes it out of their hands. We don't have to wait for them to say, we've given them since 1985 the ability to say we still need this guy or this woman uh, but now it's up to an immigration officer who's trained in the art of detecting deception and uh, they'll have to show their paperwork and letters and proof that it's a real program that they're involved in i think it's i i've been amazed at how lax it seems um and now I think part of this is partly thanks to your work for exposing some of this to the public. I want to say thank you for that. Um, let's talk about the terrorist threat in the United States. If things stay the same, it sounds like we are and have been somewhat stupidly placing ourselves at risk. Again, it almost sounds like we were a more trusting society than we should have been. So let's talk a little bit more about that two-year limit. How will that make us safer? So, so, the two, so all of these limits are envisioned to apply to 59 countries. Uh, those 59 countries are selected uh, based on a calculus of risk. Uh, China obviously has a certain kind of risk. Uh, other countries have a risk of, a higher risk of students from their coming and overstaying their visas and disappearing into the woodwork and applying for asylum or something like that. Uh, the two-year limit is being applied in the case of Muslim-majority countries, uh, many of which are in states of unrest or civil war or uh, you know economic uh, collapse and that sort of thing. Think Libya, Somalia, you know some of these. Um, countries in the uh, Middle East that are, that are war-torn and that sort of thing. And so there's, this regulation looks at that a little bit askance and says, yeah, we'll take your students, but in two years, and assuming that most programs are like a four-year university program and then maybe graduate school another two years, or could be a law program or something like that that's longer than the four years, but but all of those people who are coming in for anything longer than an associate's degree will just simply have to report to Department of Homeland Security officers 
and, and submit to questioning, an in-person interview, um, database checks on your fingerprints, checks of your social media, whatever they want to check, they can check and they will do terrorism database checks and make sure that while you were here, you weren't, you know, kind of going down the wrong rabbit hole, um, that you haven't uh, radicalized or that you're um, up to no good. And I think that's just prudent administration, Homeland Security administration that any country in the world would want to do. But for whatever reason, uh, politics have gotten in on this and you're having uh, students who are claiming that, you know, this is somehow unfair and terrible and you know, put a chilling effect on students applying. It's not going to do any such thing. If once every two years you have to come in and reapply, put your fingerprints down and reapply, and you've got nothing to hide, this is a no big deal. It's, it's not asking that much. I mean, for you get a four-year degree, you go see them. So you apply, you get in. You get to see them once every two years. That's not a bad deal when you think about it. And you apply for an extension. And, uh, you know, if you're not in the program anymore and it was um, under the, the system right now that we have and you dropped out of the program, there's very, very little uh, backstop to check uh, to, to find somebody like that. They just can disappear and or, you know, apply to some other program that's kind of phony or get a friend to submit a letter or whatever. Um, it's just too easy to stay for, in some cases, decades. People have worked the system the way it is to stay for years and years and years because they just like it here. They just want to live here. Well, we, we educate the world. That's the definite truth of that as far as schools. I mean, all the dictators from the other countries send their children to the United States for, for their education. They may want to rule the world, but they don't want to teach them. They don't want to properly educate their masses so they can stay in control. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of surprised when you hear people saying this is, oh, this is horrible. This is, well, what do you got to do? You got you to gotta have an appointment with, it, it doesn't sound very hard or difficult to maintain. It just sounds like an interview, which, you know, interviews can be short. They can be brief, but if you've got flags coming up in the interview, oh yeah, we we want to know more. <laughs> That's it, another story. If you have nothing to hide and you're willing to be truthful, this is pro forma. You just go through it. There should be no problem with this whatsoever. This is reasonable and sober and rational and any country would or could want to do this. I actually looked at University of Hawaii during a I was, was it during the beginning of this or, yeah, it was during one the beginning of when Trump uh, started writing, reg, uh, reg, starting changing the regulations on uh, things. And Hawaii actually sued President Trump to allow the, the students to get in from the other countries. And I went back and I looked and I found out they had such a low percentage of students coming from the quote banned countries. Uh, I think I actually counted them as under 20. And they were saying they were going to lose thousands and thousands of dollars. So even the places that claim this is going to be a horrible upset, financially, there are very few universities who actually recruit or take a lot of students from these particular countries that we're talking about. Um, well, well, listen, uh, academic universities don't do security vetting. That's not their job. Their job is to educate. Uh, but right now, you essentially have universities and different kind of research institutions that are responsible for our homeland security vetting. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's why you have dozens of FBI counterintelligence investigations happening right now that are resulting in prosecutions and apprehensions of Chinese spies. <laughs> because... We were just letting them in on these visas, not even vetting them on the front end in Beijing or Shanghai. Uh, and by the way, I've been reading through some of the court cases on these, Paul. Uh, 
and they're fascinating uh, reading. I mean, if you're into reading court cases, not everybody. It's, it is interesting to that, but uh, I'll share with you that that when some of these PLA Army uh, servicemen and women applied, they checked the box. No, do you have any military experience? Are you a member of any military? Uh, are you paid by any military, et cetera? Do you belong to, do you, are you affiliated with any military university, um, et cetera? And they checked no, no, no. Well, when the FBI finally got onto some of these cases, they, they started out by doing a Google search on the name of that person and popped right away full photos of the students in their military regalia with their uniforms, with the with all of the you know the, the the medals and pins and and insignia and everything else, in a five minute Google search showing that they lied on the front end. So we have a vetting problem on the front end. Yeah, <laughs> as, uh, as much as in the middle and at the end, uh, I think we need to fix the security vetting on the front end when they're applying for these uh, F and J visas uh, fast. That's really scary when you think about it. They're not, if they're not doing that job to begin with, I mean, if a, if a Google search pulls something up on somebody, that says that somebody is not doing their job. I mean, I get when you can't find something, maybe 10 pages, 20 pages in. Okay, but if you, you're talking about pictures, pictures you can go through about a couple hundred in a matter of minutes. So. Yeah, come on. I mean, it's, <laughs> this is it's sad. ridiculous. And, and you know, the the Department of Justice, uh, the prosecutors are putting the photos, the Googled photos, right in the, the court record. So you can see there they are. There's the student, and they're saying, no, I am not a member of the military. And the funny thing is, is that even when the FBI agent gets the student in front of them, and they're interviewing and says, are you a member of the Chinese military? They say, no, I am not and never have been. And the agents just go, well, then what's this? You know, we, we Googled you, here you are. And they're like, okay, you got me. I, I, I'm PLA and I just didn't want to say anything. I, I, yeah, you, you got to sit there and wonder. Um, let's look at the terrorist threat in the, in the United States. It's, if things stay the same, Wow, I think I just did that one. <laughs> Sorry. The other threat, other threat is spying, which we just talked about. For those of us in the 40s and 50s, um, that was a very real constant threat. Um, we talked about it with the Cold War, and, and now the Soviet Union is gone. Um, is there any, how big a danger is this threat now that we see of, of spying that, we, that we're seeing from, definitely from China, but I, I've actually been reading articles where it's not just China, it's not just uh, places we consider enemies, it's also some of our allies as well. Everybody's here in our uh, universities and in our uh, technology companies, they're coming in on H-1Bs and J-Visas and everything else from all over the world, stealing our secrets and because they can and nobody's, move to stop them. There are no obstacles to it. The Chinese um, operation, I'll just call it an operation because uh, in May, the president canceled 1,000 Chinese uh, uh, J and F visas, canceled them outright because the spying operation from China it was that widespread. And they went, it was like turning on the light in a, in a basement and the cockroaches went running in every direction. And they're catching them at airports and their various states of flight and escape, destroying hard drives, burning thumb drives, smashing computers with hammers, uh, the whole everything. I mean, it's, it's, it's they're running away and it, it's, it demonstrates that, you know, this was a, a widespread spying operation that was happening right under everybody's noses for a long time. And what they're interested in, the Chinese, they're, they're building their military as fast as they possibly can. They're particularly interested in, in supercomputer technology as it relates to controlling nuclear explosions and uh, artificial intelligence technology with military capabilities. 
that is the, the type of stuff that these uh, arrested Chinese students were after and got and passed uh, on to the, to the Chinese military. And, you know, that's dangerous. That's, that's a, a future danger for us. If there is a military conflict, they're going to use our own knives and guns and weapons and spears against us. It's not proprietary knowledge. It's military uh, and defense stuff we're really concerned about. And that's, that's the thing to think about. You also stated in your article that the proposed changes are hardly draconian. I, I know we've kind of said this already, but tell us why you say they're hardly draconian. Cause I'm, I know there are other lib, there's a lot of sad people out there who just say, oh, there's a change, it's going to affect people. Oh, but yeah, well, explain well, that. For one thing, the, we're not capping it. We're not, we're not reducing the number. Okay. Uh, we're not, we're not putting onerous rules on this. We're not causing people to have to really jump through a million hoops where it takes months and weeks and kind of, um, killing people by bureaucracy that's not happening and it's not overly expensive i mean it's an applicant it's a reapplication fee or an, an, a, a time extension fee most of these students are coming in and paying full tuition no problem along with living expenses and everything else these are not poor students typically who are coming in doing these jobs uh, taking these uh, research positions and taking these uh, student slots. Um, it's a, it's a uh, modest uh, bureaucratic ask. Come in, reapply, bring some supporting documentation from your institution that it's real, and do an interview. Give us your biometrics too, we'll take your fingerprints and run them through things. If you've got nothing to hide, I've said this before, I'll say it again, if you've got nothing to hide, uh, you'll go through the screening. It's just not that big of a deal. If that's enough to put a chilling effect and make students not want to come here anymore, uh, I'll be surprised and maybe even bet somebody a paycheck that that doesn't happen. Hmm. I'm, I'm sadly thinking down the road where I'm hoping we have enough staff to do this. Um, that's the only thing I'm worried about when I think about this. Do we have the the amount of people that we need to do this on a continual basis. Uh, it sounds like we're pretty far behind since we haven't been doing it. Um, well, there, there are about, right now, about 1.1 million wow. F1 visa holders. And there are about, if I've got my numbers right, 640,000 J visa holders. So a million and a half plus, uh, that's a lot. Uh, but, you know, most of this stuff can be handled nowadays uh, on electronically. So, you know, you can, uh, that, the, the reason why we don't have a system like this, it used to be that you'd have to check in once a year before 1985. Okay. Uh, and that was the paper days. Uh, you know, I mean, we, we had computers, of course, but um, I don't think things were quite as um, advanced where you could process uh, large data uh, then like you can now. Oh, that's, that's really truthful, yes. Yeah, yeah, at agency. So they ditched the system back then because it was onerous. So that's a good question. Uh, but, but now it should not be as onerous, even in large numbers like that. We should be able to handle that. And so what if we have to hire uh, some more people to do the job? We, we need to do that because it's our national security at stake. I can't think of a better uh, place to invest. I agree. I want to say thank you for joining us. Uh, please tell people how they can follow your work and uh, support what you're doing. Uh, no, I appreciate that. The, the best way to see my um, uh, writings would be at toddbensman.com. Uh, everything's there, including uh, links to a page for my forthcoming book, America's Covert Border War. And uh, also, I'm a Senior National Security Fellow for the Center for Immigration Studies, CIS.org, and you can find my work there as well at the, um, the page that has my name on it. You can navigate to it. 
Uh, I want to say thank you, Todd. It's been great having you once again. God bless, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. All right. Now I can hit stop. There we go. <laughs> I, I'm amazed when I hear about all this stuff that we're not doing. I'm always kind of mind blown. I, I don't understand. We're just idiots. We're idiots. I, I've got this um, project going. Are we off? Were you, you're yeah. Going? Yeah. Well, I was going to tell you about this project that I started, which is um, a national.